Okay. Uh, we, we are live. Uh, let, let's give it one more minute. Uh, and, you know, the other sessions have to end before anybody's going to come into ours. I'd like to have, you know, one person in the room uh, before we start. Should I take while we're waiting another photograph? Would everyone like to smile again? See, we should go on a holiday with you. You can organize all the pictures. <laughs> Be happy to. I'm just loving all these background uh, noises. They're, they're um, really fascinating. Yeah, I'm show my window. That, that one wasn't mine, by the way. <laughs> but the, the windows are good. They, they, they shut out all the air and all the uh, noise. <laughs> They don't believe. See, I, I'm an American, uh, so I'm used to air conditioning, and, and there's very little air conditioning in Brussels. It's not supposed to be this warm this early in the, in the year. Um, let's give it another minute or two. Uh, see if we, you know, attract someone. And if, and if not, we'll just kick off. Yeah, it'd be nice to talk to one another anyway. Now we're here. Um, <clears throat> So let, let's do that. Yeah, I'll give, I'll give one more minute and then we'll, we'll go. Uh, oh, it would be good if I turned my sound off on my phone. Okay, good. Hello, uh, Lancat. It's nice that you could join us. I know you can't speak, but we're all saying hello to you. Uh, we're going to kick this off in about 30 seconds. Okay. Um, let's, let, let's go. Um, Oh, you know what? I, I misplaced something. Uh, okay. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, depending on where in the world you are. And, and welcome to our panel discussion on the topic, fintechs are building upon new digital technologies. Uh, firstly, I'll introduce myself and, and our, then our theme. Uh, next, I'll ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves. Then we'll circle back for introductory statements, after which we'll begin an interactive discussion with Q&A. So my name is Robert Kahn. I'm the Managing Director uh, at Automated Financial Systems, Inc. We're a fintech firm with a 50-plus year track record of successfully advancing automated bank lending. Uh, we provide the lending platform to for SME and CIB lending journeys uh, at major global, regional, and specialty banks. And I personally have worked for, advised, and sold all types of products uh, to banks, including technology, trade, payments, credit, investment, treasury, benchmarking, you know, the whole end to end throughout my career. Um, in fact, I've watched banks go from silos of paper to fully digital, real-time automated enterprises. But these are often large and cumbersome enterprises. Uh, that are slow to change and struggle to innovate. Their relationship with fintechs and, um, <clears throat> is both as a client and as a competitor. Uh, we don't know how this dynamic between fintech and traditional financial service firms will evolve. Uh, some of the competitive drivers include trust, uh, a sense of relationship, digital expertise, cybersecurity, cost, efficiency, innovation, leadership, regulator compliance, agility. And we could spend the whole session discussing any one of these themes. 
Um, but today we have, we'll cover this dynamic between banks and fintech firms uh, with a group of fintech leaders. Uh, as mentioned, I'll ask each to make a brief introduction and then we'll circle back uh, for each to make an opening um, comment. So Angela, uh, if you could go first, please. Hello, my name's Angela Yor. Um, I'm founder of Sky Parlor PR. Um, we are a fintech specialist PR consulting firm. Been going for 12 years now. Um, I'm also um, a connector, an influencer, a speaker, and a leader of my business and in the sector on advisory boards. So pleased to meet you. Thank you, Angela. Uh, King, uh, I'm just going to round my screen, so you come up next. Great. Uh, great pleasure to meet with all of you. King Leong, head of fintech at Invest Hong Kong, the Hong Kong government departments. So my, my job is basically to try to foster the fintech uh, ecosystem developments in Hong Kong by reaching out internationally for the top-notch fintech companies to invite them over to help enrich our ecosystem. Eventually, our, our role is try to make sure that we can maintain the international financial center status for Hong Kong by keeping the, all our financial services institutions uh, up notch. Thank Pleasure you, King. Everyone. Elizabeth, you're next on my screen. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Rosiello. I'm the CEO and founder of As of Finance. Uh, I started the company nine years ago. We were originally called BitPesa which some of you may know was the first company in the world to trade digital currencies like Bitcoin against African currencies, the first digital currency exchange founded by a female. And we are now all over the African continent, licensed in the UK and Europe. And we are the largest non-bank broker for all sorts of currencies, fiat and digital currencies. And we do B2B, foreign exchange, and currency trading, as well as settlement. And um, I am also the co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Committee on Blockchain. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you very much. And uh, Yuri, uh, can you uh, take it from there? Uh, hi, um, I'm Dr. Yuri Lee. Um, I represent Peer Tech. Um, our service name is Chuck. Um, we also have crypto exchange, so I come from the blockchain background. Um, GDAC is the uh, one of the top four um, crypto exchange slash cryptocurrency um, custody um, uh, focused company in Korea. We have the um, largest market share um, dealing with corporate clients. So names like Samsung, Hyundai, um, Kakao Neighbor, they are all our clients. Um, as you know, Korea is one of the um, center of this blockchain and cryptocurrency uh, market. Um, I've been in, in the industry from the pretty much the beginning. Um, myself and my founder, um, he brought Ethereum to Korea. So we've been in the scene for quite long. Uh, with the recent um, issues with um, our algorithm based stable coin, um, it's quite, um, <laughs> quite a scene. Um, but anyway, uh, we believe in blockchain. We believe that this is going to make a good change in the financial market. I myself come from very traditional financial market. I started off as an investment banker. I also work at um, Japanese uh, commercial bank. Um, yes. So for our topic, uh, I'm very excited to discuss what we can come up with. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a great panel. Uh, and now I'm going to ask each of you to make an opening statement or comments. And Angela, again, we'll start with you. So the topic is fintechs are building upon new technologies or, or new digital technologies. So I just want to tell everyone a little bit of a story about my 16 year old son called James. Um, and what the story starts at the financial crash in 2008 when James was three. And I guess. He started his, his history in payments and uh, banking, I guess, started. So in 2008, uh, um, uh, when, when the financial crash happened uh, and James was three, his grandparents at that point were still sending him checks 
which I know the Americans still love, but in the UK, it's, it, they're very rare now. You could probably put them on auction in Sotheby's because you don't see them the same anymore. Uh, but he used to have checks sent to him in the post for his birthday, and we'd have to run off to the bank to, to bank these checks. And then at school, we used to have to send in little yellow envelopes with checks in for school trips, for dinner money, for it was such a pain and it was it was so slow and we used to forget and things like that. And then that was that was kind of as he started to go into school. At, at six, we had builders in our house one day and my partner, uh, John, took some cash out of the bank to pay the builders. Again, very cumbersome to do that. But when, when James came into my room in the morning and said, Mom, look at all that money. I said, whatever you do, keep it safe. So he put it in his pocket and took it to school and gave it to his friends. So that wasn't very safe at all. But then as, as he started to sort of get to the age of about 11, that was in 2017, we really started to see the innovation of fintechs come through in his journey um, as a Generation Zer. And we had a parent pay account, which enabled him to pay for lunch and draw down money from a prepay account where he used his fingerprint at school to pay for things. And I could see that he was eating Oreos in place of paninis and good food. And I could see what he was spending his money on. So at 12, he started to get some independence. So this was 2018 now. And he had a Go Henry account, which was one of the forerunners of that Generation Z fintech bank accounts. And, you know, it was so cool. We could see what he was spending, how he was spending it, jam jars uh, for certain types of uh, spend as well. And it really started to give him that independence to look at, you know, money coming in and money coming out. In the same year, because I'm in uh, fintech PR, I was doing a project for a client and I surveyed 35 of my friends to find out how many of them were using these types of Go Henry or Challenger Bank fintech accounts for their kids. And, and I live in a very sort of suburban uh, sort of town in just outside of Manchester. And of the 35 that I surveyed, only three were using uh, Challenger Banks for their kids. And, and one of them was me. So the rest were still using the mainstream uh, banks and the banks were starting to catch up at that point as well. They were starting to launch their apps. They were still cumbersome, but they were certainly using them. Uh, and, and, and I think that the, the, the banks having catch caught up has made the challengers even more innovative and keen to get that land grab. And now, you know, some of my friends have a Starling secondary account holders for their nannies or for their carers for their kids. Um, and of course, we saw a lot of that with Starling uh, during COVID, looking after sort of the elderly who couldn't get out to buy their shopping. So, so James's evolution in money um, has gone now in 2022, where he has his own investment uh, app called the Hargreaves Lansdowne app. He has a Coinbase app as well for his crypto, which unfortunately at the minute is not doing terribly well. And he also has a Santander online banking app too. And he, he can have his own payments into that account, money from us into that account. And in fact, before I came onto this call today, he asked me for £30 for food to put into his account. So, um, you know, I think that, that all of this innovation um, is being stemmed from the amount of uh, investment which is in the sector. Um, and, you know, in 2022, the global fintech industry revenue is estimated to be 159 billion. And by 2024, over um, 188 billion uh, or 207 billion in US dollars. Um, so there's a growth of 11 percent, you know, we're going to see. So I think the investors are, are driving this innovation. The fintechs are coming into the sector and the clever people are coming into the sector, but it's the investors that can see the opportunity, especially in the developing world. So I'd be very interested in the other speakers on what's happening there because there's still customers without bank accounts, billions of customers worldwide or billions of consume, potential consumers that can enjoy 
leapfrogging to brand new fintech uh, banking. Angela, thank you. You've given us a lot to think about. Uh, I'm not going to come back with a question yet, but if I did, I'd, I'd go to trust. And, and it's great that you can see that James is eating Oreos instead of the healthy choices, but I'm not so sure. I like Big Brother knowing everything I'm doing. Uh, and, and so we may come back to trust, but right now we're going to go to King. Great. Um, again, it's a tough act to follow. Uh, thanks for, for the uh, great story. Uh, Angela. Now, I guess the, a good way for me to uh, share my piece of story is that uh, obviously we have a, a great uh, group of uh, experts here on the call. I just want to perhaps share from perspective of my work at Miss Hong Kong, where I have the privilege to literally travel around the world in the past uh, three years that I joined the governments. And I had the opportunity to really look at the characteristics from, I remember the first business trip I made was to uh, uh, Mexico. And then and, and after that, I was uh, in, in Europe, uh, in Switzerland, uh, Amsterdam, uh, a number of other European countries. And then I came back to Asia. Of course, I spent a bit of time in Singapore, in, in China. So I think of all the places I've been to, and uh, including some of the great leaders I met uh, via Zoom over the past two or three years, I came to for, for, I came to a few conclusions, uh, three to be uh, more specific in the interest of time. Now, the first thing that I noticed is that uh, we have uh, quite a lot of smart people uh, trying to solve uh, similar problems regardless of where they came from. So at the end of the day, uh, I began to ask, I, ask our, uh, myself, so if I were uh, a fintech entrepreneur trying to start something new, so what would I do? So obviously you can go by the um, you know say analysis or studies by for example CB Insights where they track a lot of the uh, different segments you know from the payments to crypto you know for banking tech insure tech you name it now but the one thing that I noticed is that I think as I see so many similar technologies where they're from like Israel or from UK or home technology in Hong Kong I mean. To be honest, I think if I step back to be an entrepreneur and try to pick something, it's difficult. It's just so competitive internationally. There's just so many smart people trying to do similar things. So of all the uh, tech people I talked to, including the VCs, uh, I finally found something that I think would be uh, of use, uh, I think, to uh, perhaps the audience on the call. as a, It's a nugget of insights. If you try to start something new today, what would that be? And the answer is... Uh, retirement. Now, of course, I think this is something that is not, uh, again, I personally participated in quite a lot of events, but sometimes, uh, you know, it's kind of uh, strange that it's such an obvious issue when we look at, for example, retirements, that uh, in, in the case of, let's say, in the U.S., they got a 401k. Uh, in the case of Hong Kong, we got something called the MPF. It's basically some kind of mandatory retirement accounts. But then I think for many of us who have those accounts, we think about uh, our own personal experience, we rarely look at those accounts, right? Whereas a lot of the other fintechs, you know, the payments app and, and all that virtual banking app, we look at it on a, on a daily basis. But yet, you have a big piece of the wealth tied up in this account that you rarely touch. So I think in a nutshell, we see that this is one of the, I would say, emerging blue ocean, if you will. Uh, so this is the first piece of observation I would like to share the audience. Now, the second thing that I, I have been observing, again, again, after going around the world, is the fintech adoption. Now, because when we look at uh, fintech adoption, let me just start with uh, consumer fintech adoption. Uh, we, we try to uh, look at a number of studies, and the one that we like to, to refer to uh, from time and time again is the ENY, the Ernst & Young uh, B2C Fintech Adoption Index. So last time that uh, they published it, it was back in, I think, 2019, uh, I wish they publish a uh, more recent one soon. Uh, interestingly, when you look at, uh, I think, some of the powerhouses, you know, places like UK, uh, that always have this big reputation for being a leading uh, fintech market. Again, you think about the US and so forth. But interestingly, when you look at the top five from a B2C fintech adoption standpoint, you don't see any of the uh, traditional powerhouses. Okay? So number one uh, is actually China. In a way, it's kind of explainable because a lot of people in China, they used to, you know, the mobile wallets, you know, the Alipay, the WeChat Pay. So I think this kind of internet culture 
make it uh, something that's very conducive to adopting fintech. It's a very natural switch. And then you're followed by, I think, places like India or uh, I think Brazil. I mean, some of the emerging market that they got really good traction at the B2C level. I think uh, UK is still up there. I think the percentage is like 71%. Uh, China's at 86 uh, interestingly, uh, the U.S. is in the 40s, the 40 percentile uh, in the index. So the second point I'm trying to make is that uh, as we look at fintech as a domain, uh, oftentimes, uh, of course, looking at some of the leaders like the U.S. and U.K. are f- fantastic places to look at, to learn, to learn from. But at the same time, uh, don't, don't lose track of what's happening in the emerging markets uh, and, and in Asia in particular. There's just a lot of innovation, a lot of consumer adoption that propel the firms to further innovate. So this is the second piece of insight. And last but not least is about uh, the, the, the crypto NFT world. Uh, we just see so much enthusiasm, particularly in NFT this year. Uh, there's a firm in Hong Kong called Animoca Brands. And one, one of the firms that they uh, acquired a couple of years ago, now the headlines is called Sandbox. And this firm has been on fire literally for the past few months in which uh, some of the big boys on uh, banking sector, such as HSBC, uh, Standard Chartered Bank, they bought the land, or the virtual land, on Sandbox, and uh, they could do something with it. So, so my point is, is that I think because of the uh, sort of uh, I'll say just massive uh, progress uh, in the sort of crypto space and NFT space in Hong Kong, we just see that I think that momentum actually carry, uh, carry on into the so-called traditional banking sector. So even some of the major players like HSBC and Santa Charter are now jumping on the bank record. So I guess uh, with that, I'll probably uh, just stop here. I'm sure we have other discussions uh, later on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ken. You made a, a lot of good points, and we'll come back to them. Uh, Elizabeth, I hope your name, are you, is your network fine? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, over to you. Well, um, I've been in this space since mobile money was introduced on the African continent. So when I started my company, I had already worked five years with mobile money in Kenya. And that's why our company was named BitPasa because we connected to M-Pasa. And I arrived in Kenya in 09, right at the start of that. And I think we hear a lot about leapfrogging legacy infrastructure in terms of FinTech, but it's much more than that, I think. There were a lot of, there was a lot more legacy infrastructure than I guess many people assumed at the time in Kenya. And it was more just it was better user experience, better pricing, and it was very intuitive product. So I think um, what we need to keep thinking about in every iteration of FinTech, whether it's mobile money, whether it's digital money, um, whether it's going into Web3 is, again, let's not forget the basics of building a business. And um, I was one of the first companies in the space in, in crypto and um, of course, the markets in Africa are nowhere near that of the mega markets like Korea. I think it would take five African markets to get even to a proportion of that. But what we have seen is we've seen a lot of different innovation per region. So, you know, while we do see fintechs globally growing, we also see a lot of regional fintechs truly winning a piece of a market. And I think that's what's so good about a, a fintech is that you can kind of enter a market um, with relatively low barrier to entry, regulation is growing, of course, that is definitely a barrier to entry, but you're able to iterate really on the unique needs of that geography and that demographic. So we're seeing a much better customer experience. We're seeing a much better pricing than we before. And I think that's what's really going to kill um, traditional finance or, you know, we say TradFi is because you just can't have that speed of iteration. And, you know, you made a point of that a little bit earlier when you mentioned Angela checks versus still being existing in the U.S. and you had bank transfers. I remember I was an, uh, an intern in Germany way, way, way a long time ago, uh, 25 years ago, and we had bank transfers then. So I think really the, it's the regional needs that are being addressed and we're seeing some global impacts, but um, I think we still see a lot of regional winners. And in, in sub-Saharan Africa, We've seen so much fintech innovation starting in Kenya 10 years ago, now in Nigeria, Egypt, Senegal, um, and Southern Africa. And what we're most excited about is how it's being customized for market. And as a finance, you know, we are truly pan-African. And at the same time, we have all of the UK European compliance 
because a lot of our customers are from outside of Africa who then use us to enter into that into the market. And I think that's actually pretty interesting in that you have localized products, localized sales, but you know, you need to have compliance everywhere, everywhere you go. And so I think when you see fintech start to scale, there is a real barrier for fintech scaling because of the need for these like repeated regional compliance. And I've seen that that's been quite a, a trend recently that we see a lot of fintechs win in one market, but unable to exit to the next market. Um, there's a couple of global, global dominators, but we haven't seen that many kind of grow through that stage. And one last thing I just wanted to say is that, you know, as uh, we've partnered with FTX, which is the second largest crypto company in the world, and we just announced quite a big and exciting partnership, and we'll be their exclusive provider across the African continent. And that shows that even a very large company, fast growing, um, best in class leader, didn't have the regional expertise to kind of enter this entire continent, which as we know is the fastest growing um, young demographic in the, in the world right now, and especially the mega markets like Nigeria and Ethiopia and Egypt. And um, we're really excited to provide that regional knowledge, the regional compliance, the regional user experience, and of course, all the financial on and off ramps it takes to offer payment, settlement, foreign exchange, and, and treasure solutions. So I think the, the themes there of really knowing that local market, being able to scale between markets, takes quite a lot of investment and expertise on scaling up. And we're going to see some consolidation where global players have to partner with those local, those local and regional fintechs. Elizabeth, thanks a lot. I, I've got lots of questions for you. I don't know if we'll get to them or not, but you've given me a lot to think about. So thank you. Uh, Yuri, uh, if you'd like to go next. Yes. Um... King has covered Hong Kong. I'll cover um, the regions in Asia that I'm more familiar with, Korea, Japan, and China. Um, speaking of digitalization in finance, um, as you know, uh, Korea, I don't know if you know well, everyone has plastic cre uh, credit card. Uh, I haven't seen paper money in so long or <laughs> the chains. Uh, we all use um, credit card. If you go to China, they skip plastic era. They're all using mobile pay. But what's happening in Japan, many of the taxis, the cabs, they still don't accept um, credits or mobile pay. They still have to pay the paper money. So the um, development of this digitalization fintech has been very different while we're just right next to each other. Um, why so? Uh, the regulatory reasons, um, many others, um, I guess. Um, but in the recent days, uh, Korea has been uh, quite in the um, attention, especially with blockchain and cryptocurrency. Um, in many aspects, uh, perhaps because of the regulatory ground, uh, Korea is the, uh, one of the very few or the perhaps the only country with the uh, licensed uh, virtual asset service provider um, um, environment uh, where the financial authority clearly defines what kind of security, what kind of um, human resources, the organization structure, all the manual uh, rules, everything has to be laid out. So while, um, uh, while Elizabeth mentioned that there is a low barrier to entry, Korea actually the barrier to entry is not just high, new, new, um, new players cannot enter. There is a um, very tricky uh, part of the regulation that in order for you to be licensed, you have to have a history of operating the um, the, um, the company in the crypto market. And um, right now, it's illegal to um, illegal to sell your products, uh, anything related to cryptocurrency. So there, it's it's a um, it's hindering newcomers to enter. Now there's only about um, 20 players in whole, uh, including the custody, the wallet providers and exchanges. Um, but still what's a good sign here is that uh, Korea, is, um, Korea is becoming a good example in this um, cryptocurrency and blockchain uh, fintech industry uh, in that, for example, um, travel rule by uh, FATF, it's recommended to uh, most of the countries and Korea is the only country where it's mandatory to follow. 
So travel rule, as you, as you guys are all in fintech industry, you very well know, we have to KYC both the sender and recipient wallet. So it's just as the switch system. Now there's no black money in the market in Korea, um, which quite makes us to be in an island though, um, sending crypto to Binance, uh, Coinbase, FTX is just a lot of extent, uh, it's uh, difficult or it's uh, nearly blocked to be in the middle ground. Um, but Korean government is very um, firm in making sure there is no anti-money laundering happening. But there's um, on the flip side of the coin, what's good is that they are uh, encouraging this industry to grow very fast while, um, you know, uh, ruling out all the negativities in the script industry, uh, especially with the new um, administration that was just elected. Um, they're not, they have now announced that they will allow uh, ICO in Korea, which is a big issue. Um, the projects, the agencies uh, mostly went to um, Singapore to um, do initial coin offering. So most of the issuer companies were in Singapore, but now the Korean government is allowing um, ICO to fundraise based on cryptocurrency. Um, as King mentioned, NFT, Metaverse is all very hot in Korea. All the large companies have their own blockchain mainnet, like um, SK, Samsung, um, all of those companies has developed their um, technology of their own blockchain um, that is able to um, issue NFT, crypto, and et cetera. Now in Korea, we already have products where we can um, digitalize um, actual assets um, such as real estate, art, um, intellectual property. Um, it's already being traded under the securities law. So it, the um, development of not just the regulation, but also the market is growing tremendous, tremendously. Uh, for example, um, the traders in the stock market in Korea is um, still about um, 1,000K. 1,000K while it's um, 1.5 times more for the crypto traders. The barrier to um, on board just downloading an app it's much easier that the um, the age in Korea to um, age under 19, it's illegal for them to trade. But beyond that, up to 70, 80, they're all trading crypto. And it's not just the virtual assets, but it's also the assets based on like real estate. Um, what the essence of that is that you can liquidate the assets that used to be, you know, intangible intangible, both uh, assets that we can now use. Like for example, um, before today, if you don't have a daily salary, you cannot pay your tax. You cannot just live your life without you know, earning money daily because with, if you just had a house, you still have to pay um, tax to maintain your house, right? But now uh, with this um, visualization of asset um, that's allowed, you can sell portions of your house to live your daily life. That's a big change today uh, where assets are being uh, considered completely different. Um, us pure tech that we are in the space, not just because we think crypto is cool <laughs> or the market is large, but we believe that this, is can, this can make a huge innovation, um, so much efficiency in cost, in um, transmitting money, or um, securing your asset, diversifying your asset, um, utilizing your asset. Um, so that's where we come into the space. And you're, you're, thank you. I think that that speaks to. Well, I think all of you spoke to the advantages that fintechs bring. Um, you know, I'm going to put my risk management hat on here for a moment and, and say, well, there also are some significant risks. And so Open the New York Times today, which is a, you know, a leading uh, newspaper, a global newspaper, and, and one of the key uh, headlines is, uh, and King, I'm gonna ask you to talk about this, how a trash talking crypto founder caused a 4 billion uh, crash. Do Kwan, a South Korean entrepreneur, hyped the Luna and Terra US 
dollar uh, cryptocurrencies. Their failures have devastated some traders. They're not the investment firms that crashed out, cashed out early. So, uh, King, I, you know, this is uh, a global and Asian phenomena. Uh, I'm sure there's a market reaction and a regulatory reaction in Hong Kong. Can you speak about that a bit? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you for the, uh, the question. <clears throat> uh, definitely, that, that uh, is a pretty significant event. But in some ways, uh, when I talk to our colleagues uh, and regulator, uh, the SFC, Securities and Futures Commissions, uh, that in a way, uh, they got some vindication because uh, for the past uh, number of years, uh, the, the SFC has been literally going around the world to talk to their own colleagues in other regulators in other jurisdictions. Uh, and in the end, they, they concluded that uh, they would like to so-called pick the gold standard, if you will, because obviously you can uh, facilitate innovation and make, make it very easy right, for retail uh, consumers to get access to. But in the end, after looking at different uh, uh, point of views of, around the world, uh, SFC thought, well, perhaps we should just start with the professional investors. Now, I think that this is for good reason, because first of all, the professional investors, uh, these people are, are more, more savvy and well informed. But more importantly, I mean, these people would know, supposedly, uh, how to manage the risk. Okay, now, so this is the first thing that they did. In, in some ways, uh, I think the market was a little upset initially, because uh, it wasn't open to the overall retail market. Uh, the second thing that they did was to make sure that uh, somebody is on the hook. Okay, so when you are, you know, whether you're trading cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, from the Bitcoin, you know, the, the, the Cardano and... You know, even stable coins and so on is fine, but then somebody, if something goes wrong, I mean, somebody's on a hook. Okay, so basically, it's when they gave out the license to the uh, um, uh, virtual asset trading platform. At the moment, Hong Kong has uh, two companies that received the, uh, the license. One, we got a license. The second is approval in principle. Now, what, what they want to make sure is that uh, this platform, they have to ensure that they, they've gone through to get some holes or due diligence to pick the custodian. And the client's assets have to be ring fenced at, with the custodian. Okay. Now, and why is this important? Because I think there's another news around the time of the, the Luna news. Uh, it was probably around uh, I think a few days that uh, Coinbase, they, they, I think uh, they somehow came out with a, a press release. And I don't know why, why, what prompted them to say that. But anyway, when they came out and say, oh, by the way, yeah, uh, for all the clients' money in our custodian, in case we're in trouble, we're going to use some of those money to pay off our debts. So people are like, oh, my God, it's, it's, what's, what's the custodian for? As a result, I think the Coinbase uh, share price just dropped uh, you know, like a stone uh, on that single day. And in a way, the, the regulator in Hong Kong, they, they re really want to do something where they are able to protect the investors when, when things don't go you know, properly, I hope it don't go well, like the past, like the past week. And I believe that that incident, while it's unfortunate for some of the investors uh, holding the uh, the coin, I think it's like something like a 10 billion write down or something. But then I think this is also a good message sent uh, to uh, the regulators around the world to see what's the, where to draw the line to protect the investors, make sure that this sort of thing will not happen. Yeah, I think, so, I so think this, the regulators are, sure. got caught unawares here or you know, it got, uh, but but it, it it creates a question in my mind for you, Elizabeth. Um, you know, you, you're working in s some markets that are not viewed as being as well regulated as, as certain others. At the same time, you, you have to comply with your services with EU and, and UK uh, regulations. So can you talk a little bit about what advantage that gives you in the market, how uh, that complicates your offering, how, you know, what, what, what's the advantage and disadvantages that you gain from uh, that positioning? Sure. Well, first of all, we're not a retail exchange. We service OTC and wholesale clients, um, and we're more using this for the, for the back end. So we trade amongst our own counterparties. It's a wholesale treasury business. And in, in normal vocabulary words, that means... I only trade with very large businesses and other exchanges, um, and the retail users don't have access, don't have any kind of 
exposure to the cryptocurrencies. Now, that's just my business model. It's not a judgment on that. That's number one. Um, number two, I think these days, I've, I've been at two other conferences this week, and there's a lot of things that fly around about this industry, but pretty much every single legitimate cryptocurrency exchange, digital currency exchange these days has very strict KYC and AML on-ramp and off-ramp. 90% of the exchanges have this. Yes, there are people that will meet you for a peer-to-peer -peer exchange or a DeFi exchange. And it's just an investor's choice. I mean, there are very compliant ways to access this. And then if you're looking for wild volatility and, you know, unlicensed products, there's that as well. But I think the these these product offering, it's very clear which one is which. So um, I, I think for the user, you know, they go into these exciting products because they are excited by the wild highs and lows. Um, and it, it's the same thing as like penny stock trading or not. But there are a lot of stable coins like USDC, which are actually stable. And there are a lot of digital currencies which have just, you know, slowly accumulated value and gone up. So I think um, I am actually using this for settlement. It's easier for me to trade digital currency with a client on Friday night in a Nairobi time zone, and they're still awake in, in Hong Kong and we're trading with them or California. Just makes a lot more sense than, you know, only settling via Swift from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. U.S. time. I don't operate in those time zones. So literally just on time zone settlement, trading in digital currencies makes a lot of sense. And that has no additional risk or compliance. Number, and another thing is that we, we can trade in the weekends. And I process for a lot of large remittance companies. Now, if they have a holiday or they have Mother's Day or it's Ramadan, their actually highest values are between Friday and Monday. And often they need to top up or they need to purchase more foreign exchange. Um, there's a high foreign exchange risk for them if they buy on Friday and sell all weekend and then Monday. So we're actually reducing their risk if we let them pay in the digital currency and we can do that wholesale transaction during the weekend. So I think companies can self-regulate, investors and participants can choose which companies they want to work with. And this sector is not all about um, retail personal investment. There are a lot of infrastructure reasons and global wholesale settlement reasons why digital currencies are just superior. And, you know, we're a living, breathing proof of this. And we've been using it for, you know, nine years doing just that. Uh, anyone want to comment on that? I I think, uh, it's Go great ahead. to see, you know, that it, it, the innovation, you know, the, that, that, you know, the whole crypto world and, and the digital currency world has brought. Um, I, I do think that, you know, like a lot of um, sort of new tech, whether it's fintech, health tech, um, whatever tech, the tech's always faster than the regulators. And, you know, uh, because that's the nature of innovation, it's, it's you know, it's about you know, make, tr trying new things. And I think the regulators are all about making sure that it's done safely. So, I'd, I, you know, I think the regulators need to catch up. And I also think that we'll probably see more government-based stable coins coming through from different world governments, um, you know, which hopefully will, will sort of perpetuate broader use of uh, blockchain uh, in, in currency as well. So, um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's just that the speed and rate of change that's happening with Moore's law um, has speeded up again and, and, and our governments are behind, behind the game. So perhaps it's time that some of you entrepreneurs went and, you know, sort of ran some of our sort of banking institutions and, and helped to speed things up a bit. Well, and um, we, we've, seen, we've seen that in, in other markets and other areas where people have gone from uh, investment banks and industry into the regulatory side. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, they come out and they make a lot more money, but that's another story. Uh, Yuri, I, I haven't got a question for you, but, I, I you know, we've got two minutes. I want to give you some floor time to comment on what's been said. Yes, um, to add on to um, what Elizabeth and um, Angela mentioned as well. Um, yes, there needs to be a good balance between innovation, 
um, room for technology to grow and for regulation to come in, especially with the um, recent um, trouble with the algorithm-based um, stablecoin that has um, made you know too many people lose their um, tremendous amount of money or investments that they have um, put into. Um, of course, um, investors make their own choice, but us like um, exchanges, we should um, bar up the um, listing procedures, um, the qualifications for these um, cryptocurrencies to be listed on legitimate um, exchanges. That's very important. Um, those um, exchanges where they list hundreds of products and delist hundreds of products after just several months, um, it should not be happening um, to make, you know, most of it just is to make money to, you know, collect fees from new investors that come in. Um, however, still, um, I want to um, make sure that we do not lose hope in this cryptocurrency or stable coin. Uh, it is definitely making our life much easier um, reduce risk in uh, foreign exchange exposure. Um, and also would like to give uh, maybe a good relieving news to <laughs> some of the investors uh, that might be listening to this um, talk. Um, uh, the two founders of um, Terra Luna, uh, one is American, one is Korean. Um, now Korean prosecutors are on them. <laughs> they were sued by investors in Korea. Uh, their uh, FCC, SEC is also after, the Singaporean government is after. There is clear regulation where they're going to uh, make sure they pay for um, certain uh, crimes or fraud that they committed. Um, as you know, there are white papers when, they're, when uh, they issued those cryptocurrency projects. Um, they were not on that um, promise that they kept. Uh, they were to be kept. And um, certain um, uh, protocols that they issued, the Anchor, Anchor Protocol, for, for example, they guaranteed 20% of return, which is illegal in Korea. So they will be held on the um, court. So um, this is not the end of the industry, I hope. I hope it's not bringing another crypto winter. I hope it continues to bring uh, good technological um, digitalization and um, you know, advance of this um, well, good I, I, think, I think wrapping this on, up on your hope rather than your last comment <laughs> is uh, constructive. I also think we're in an industry uh, where, you know, when Elizabeth went in 2009 to Kenya, um, we're in a different place than we were, uh, you know, 13 years ago, but it's still, uh, uh, you know, emerging industry. And there's lots of uh, changes that we can expect, lots of competitive factors in play over the coming decades. So I want to thank each of you for your contribution. I'm sorry we don't have more time. We're already a couple minutes past the, the deadline. Um, I also want to thank the audience for joining. Uh, Ivy, thank you. Bill, always good to uh, see you. Hopefully we'll be able to do something in person sometime. Um, but thank you so much. And uh, uh, Angela, look forward to the pictures. <laughs> I will send them to you all shortly. Take care, everybody. Have thank a great you. day, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks. 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 Thanks.